Hello, welcome. We're going to give everyone a few more minutes to join. Hello, welcome everyone. We're just giving everyone a few minutes to join the, the webinar and we'll be starting shortly. Okay, hello everybody, welcome. Welcome to our webinar, Get to Know the Science and Engineering Indicators. My name is Amy Burke. I am the Program Director for Science, Technology, and Innovation Analysis at the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, known as NCSES. NCSES is the National Science Foundation's statistical agency and one of 13 principal statistical agencies throughout the federal government. We gather and disseminate data in a neutral and objective way to track the state of science and engineering in the United States and how we compare internationally and across our states nationally. Our partnership with the National Science Board is part of our mission under the board's guidance we produce a series of resources that provide data indicators of the state of the US science and engineering enterprise known as science and engineering indicators or what we like to refer to as indicators for short. Indicators data are intended to inform are intended to inform the understanding of the science and engineering ecosystem. They show trends in STEM education, the STEM labor force, research and development in both industry and academia innovation, and public perceptions of science and technology. And indicators data tools are available for both the national and state level. This past April, we held a webinar specifically about state data. State data. The recording of this webinar is available on the National Science Board's YouTube channel. We will forward that link to you and also put it in the chat here. We encourage you to check it out for more information on what we have available at the state level for your analytical and information needs. But in today's webinar, we will give you an overview of the indicators website, its extensive functionality, the importance of these reports and data, and all the ways these tools can be used to inform decision making within government, education, and industry. Before we get started, I have a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording this webinar. There is not an open chat for this Zoom, but we will be providing links to various resources resources in the chat window for all attendees to view throughout the webinar. So please check for updated information throughout. We also invite you to use the Q&A function throughout the webinar, which you can access at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to respond to questions in real time, and we'll also leave questions during the last part of today's webinar. Now, let's get started. And let me ask each of our panelists to please introduce themselves. First, let me start with the NCSES director, Emilda. Thank you, Emilda. Amy, and hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Yes, I'm the head of NSF's statistical agency, the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, as Amy referred to us as NCSES. And I've spent my entire federal career as a data geek in the federal statistical system. And I really have promoted a vision of securely liberating data. So in this particular role, I am liberating data for the science and engineering enterprise. Throughout my career, I've often been called on to address data gaps that are critical to information for our nation, such as apportionment at the Census Bureau. 
or energy conserving policies and opportunities for homes and for businesses where I worked at the Energy Information Administration. Now in my role as the chair of the Evidence Advisory Committee on Data for Evidence Building, I am working with a team of experts all over several employment sectors where we are bringing our expertise and our experiences to create actionable recommendations around building a national wide data infrastructure. I really believe that it could change the US landscape and the thinking around data. We'll be acquiring, linking and disseminating data to inform policies to improve our lives. As a trained mathematical statistician, my core values focus on data quality and relevance. As a leader, I thrive on partnerships and collaborations to meet data needs. For today, I'm looking forward to a great discussion around one of our flagship reports, Indicators. Over to you, Amy. Thank you, Amilda. So glad to have you joining us. And so now I want to go to our next, uh, our next panelist to introduce himself, Kay. Hi, my name is Kay Koizumi. I'm currently the Principal Deputy Director for Policy at the White House Office of Science Technology Policy, or OSGP. I've been working in science policy and research on science policy for almost 30 years. Uh, from when I was a student and I was first introduced to the indicators data we're talking about today. I've spent a career at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, focusing on federal research and development funding and data. That was when I uh, started really working with SNE indicators data. And over the years, I've relied on these data and contributed to those data on occasion. Uh, I was here in the Office of Science Technology Policy in the Obama administration as an assistant director for federal research and development. And at, during that time, I transitioned from being a science policy researcher to being a science policy practitioner. And I hope now a science policy maker. So I've been a long time science and technology policy researcher and practitioner, and I'm happy to have the chance to share with you today how I use those data and how I hope you all who are attending this seminar can use the, the data in indicators as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kay. We've really appreciated the way that you have been um, joining us in the, your use and, and, and the way that you um, you know, um, come alongside us in, in um, putting these data out. So I'm so glad to have you. And so now for our third panelist, Victor, um, please introduce yourself and let everyone know who you are. Thank you, Amy. My name is Victor McCrary, and I am the vice chair of the National Science Board, as well as I am the vice president for research at the University of the District of Columbia, the nation's capital's only public land grant HBCU. Go Firebirds. For the past 20 years, I have been in the role as an executive at the um, University of the District of Columbia, Morgan State University, University of Tennessee, and the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as well as the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, overseeing investments in terms of new technologies to guide those investments to develop new capabilities and to explore new avenues of both basic and applied research. I started my, my career as a chemist working for the past 10 years at AT&T Bell Laboratories early in my career, where I looked at everything during my career from electronic books to quantum information to tactical autonomy and semiconductor research. I've been serving on the board for the past six years. Since 2016, I'm glad to be reappointed uh, by President Biden. And I look forward to this discussion on indicators because indicators really helps the board in terms of our governance role, not only as advisors to the president and the Office of Science and Technology Policy, but also advising the National Science Foundation of where they should be putting their investments to make the next big thing. And also to make sure that we have a workforce that is ready to take on the challenges that we have in terms of science engineering for not, for only, not only for global competitiveness, but for the best of the country. Thanks, Vic. So glad to have you here. Welcome to you, to all of you, our panelists, and all the people here on the call. Thank you so much for joining us for this important discussion. Before we get to the main event, though, I'd like to take just a moment to go over our indicators website. 
I want to demonstrate to you some of the extremely useful functionality and also how you yourself can go in there to navigate the breadth of this publicly available data source. So let me take us to our website. And as you can see, um, can everyone see my web, the website? Yes, okay. So as you can see, the website contains a wealth of information on the US s &E enterprise, beginning with the um, latest congressional report, the state of US science and engineering shown here in blue. But today we want to explore the focus area reports that provide high quality data on, science and on the science and engineering enterprise in the US. Over here on the right side of the website, you can see that um, we have our most up-to-date reports and they can be found here on the landing page, but let's go ahead and dive right on in. So if we go ahead and click to our focus, to our, um, focus area or thematic reports, you can see that they um, are available by, on a regular basis and can be looked up by focus area, as you see here, or by the published date, as you can see here. And these are all the reports that we have available right now. Currently, there are seven focus areas that cover a range of content. These focus areas may grow or change over time. Each focus area um, contains reports updated with updated data for comparison under that particular topic. When you choose a report, you'll see a um, introductory summary and a button to access the full report. Once inside, you will have direct access to the report's executive summary, and you can um, navigate here on the side, on the left-hand side, through all the sections, and it's very simple and intuitive. Figures are actually interactive and include hover over um, capabilities, and they can be popped out for easier reading. They also provide two views of the analysis, a graphical view, as you can see here, and you can also uh, click for a table view. You can also share this uh, figure very easily up here in the right-hand corner, or you can download it in multiple formats. Another great capability is that if you go down to the data tab on the left-hand navigation, you can quickly and easily see all the data that's included in each report via the tables, the figures, and the data sources. This allows you to um, download just parts of the report or the entire report if you're interested um, in that capability. Now, if you are not exactly sure of the report you want to view, we have built in a topical search function, which enables visitors to find specific information on, and gain exposure to other topic areas. On this page, you can choose the subject you are researching, hone in on a key interest area, and it will point you to the exact reports that include data on that subject. Back on the indicators homepage, you can also access the state indicator site, which I mentioned at the beginning that we do have a webinar available on. We encourage you to visit the site regularly and to explore the useful information and data available to you. Now that you've seen the overview, I'd like to go back to our panelists to share their perspectives on the data in these reports. All right, so let's get started. And I would like to, um, I would like to ask our uh, panelists for their perspectives on indicators. And I'd like to start with UK. As a longtime user of the indicators reports and data and someone who has worked in science pol policy for most of your career, can you tell us how and why you turn to these data? Thank you. Well, Thank you. I turn well, to these turn data to because you know, in, in our work, evidence has to back up policy and data backs up our policy. And unbiased, reliable data is where we have to start. Indicators is the source of that. You know, the data and indicators showed us that the science, technology, engineering, mathematics workforce or STEM workforce in the United States is dwindling relative to other countries. And our STEM workforce lags in representation of women, underrepresented minorities, and persons with disabilities. So policy and decision makers like me who advise policy makers such as the president and vice president, uh, we try to uh, address these issues when we advise on policy to expand the STEM workforce. And to do that, we have to start with the data. We also look at global data on R&D investments. For example, for many years, the US was barely in the top 10 among nations investing the largest share of their economies on R&D when we used to be number one. 
it appeared we were falling behind, especially to China, which was gaining on us. But in recent years, that has turned around and now the US is one of the few nations investing more than 3% of our economy on R&D. That doesn't mean we can be complacent. We still need to evaluate carefully where we should be making R&D investments. And the detailed data and indicators helps us understand funding sources, performers, location, type of research, fields, et cetera. You know, without these data, we'd be making decisions more or less blind. So these data are the foundation for consequential decisions by US leaders. I'm gonna start at the top. President Biden has said repeatedly in speeches, and I quote, decades ago, the federal government used to invest 2% of our entire GDP, 2% of our GDP in research and development. We are down to investing less than 1%, end quote. So he uses these data to make the case for his administration's policies to turn around the decline. In this case, the policies in the Bipartisan Innovation Act that's before Congress right now. He also says, quote, we were ranked number one in the world in R&D three decades ago. Number one, now we're ranked number nine in the world, end quote. Does that sound familiar? Well, it should. Where do these data and other data the president cites come from? From indicators. So if the president can rely on uh, these data, then I think, you know, we, could, we all can. And uh, that's my case for making use of these bountiful and reliable data. Wow, thanks, Kay. That's quite the endorsement. Thank you so much. It's great to get your, um, just your perspective and where you're seeing these data pop up um, in some really obviously impactful places. So uh, thank you for sharing your perspective. But I'd like to now direct this question to Victor. So uh, Vic, with the concerns over global competition, how have the indicators data helped the National Science Board, where you serve as the vice chair, develop long-term policy solutions? Thank you, Amy. Uh, following on what Kay said, indicators has been great. It provides a lot of data. But then once you have the data, the next question is, well, what are you gonna do about it, okay? Uh, when you look at the data, and then you interpret it, you have to look at a number of things and say, okay, what are we gonna do? And in terms of global competition, just to point out some numbers, you know, over the past uh, almost two decades, you know, in terms of R&D funding and our competitiveness, we've moved from 31% down to about 21%, okay? Uh, in our rear view mirror, as, as Kay has said, China is there in terms of expenditures, they're there in terms of patents, they're there in terms of publications, they actually put out more bachelor degrees in engineering than we have here in the United States. And so when you look at these numbers, you ask ourselves, where are we? Well, quite frankly, the science board has seen this movie before. It's called 1957 and it's called Sputnik, okay? When we thought after World War II, we were preeminent in terms of science and engineering and look up in the sky and there we were. We had a satellite there, we felt, Obviously, we're behind in terms of space exploration and communications. Not only did that have an impact on us from an economic point of view, but it has an impact on us from a national security point of view. So in looking at this, I would say the first start where the board has taken and used indicators was crafting a vision uh, for science and engineering for the United States. Uh, that exercise started about four or five years ago, resulting in the unveiling in 2020 of Vision 2030. Where do we want the United States to be uh, 10 years from now? And understanding that quite frankly, we are in a Sputnik II moment right now. If you look in terms of math scores across the country, you know we are seventh out of 37 in terms of science. We're about 25th out of 37 in terms of math. And so the board crafted this vision that say, how can we propel forward? And with this vision, working with policymakers like Kay and our national leaders, what can we do? One of the things that came out of Vision 2030 was that there were four areas that we would invest in and look forward to. And that is, for example, the geography of innovation. How can we look at for innovation across the entire country? The second thing would be uh, global uh, cooperation. The third thing is, what are the benefits of research? Uh, 
the investments that we make, both in basic and applied research, how is that helping the country? And then finally, the most important pillar of them all is talent. How do we cultivate and develop talent uh, both within this country as well as attract talent to this country so that we can at least maintain our competitiveness? And so that is where indicators has really played a good role. I would also say uh, kudos to you and your team because one of the aspects of talent we looked at was the skilled technical workforce. Those are the folks who uh, use STEM-based skills but do not have a bachelor's degree. But if you look at the whole STEM workforce, it's about 23 to 25% of the entire US workforce. And of that workforce, 20 million or well over half are people who uh, comprise the skilled technical workforce or when we go out on the trail, sometimes we use the term blue collar STEM. And these are folks who are in the oil and gas industry, in the IT industry, in the health in industry. Um, these are folks who are electricians. These are folks who are welders who are using very sophisticated tools and have to have a level of knowledge. Again, this is not your father's or your mother's electrician that are needed for our economy to stay competitive. Again, uh, kudos to indicators. And this is how it's helped us put a vision for 2030, a vision that I, I know that we are going to achieve. Thanks, Vic. Um, always great to hear you uh, speak our statistics back to us. I, I know you have notes there, but I think you know a lot of this by heart. But I want to now turn the conversation over here to Emilda. Um, so Emilda, you, from the perspective of someone, of the person who is leading the um, collection and dissemination efforts of um, the information gathered by NCSES, can you talk a little bit about how that data are gathered? And why is it, why is it so useful from your perspective to those who recommend policy or our decision-making leaders in government or industry. Thank you, Amy, and thank you to Kay and to Victor. I think we just heard narratives about why this data is so important um, for policymaking. And I'm sure that the staff at NCSES joined me in thanking um, both OSTP and the National Science Board and others in terms of the use of our data, which is policy relevant and policy neutral but there, it does take a village. So it takes quite a few staff who conduct national level surveys, as well as using administrative data. We work with the communities that you might not think of. We work with laboratories to collect data from them, from nonprofits, from statistical agencies, and from other governments. We're working with several communities across the science and engineering enterprise to gather data from them in order to meet policy needs. And what's exciting about that is that in doing so, we're building their trust. The trust that we're going to use this data for the purpose that we have um, told them that we're going to use it for. And now we see and we hear from Kay and Victor just exactly how impactful that is. I'd also like to just take a moment to think about what did it take for us to address a topic like the skill technical workforce that was mentioned. This was something that we started to hear conversations about and said, we want to provide more useful data on this topic. That appears maybe to be beyond the scope of NCSES in terms of those who have a bachelor's and beyond where we usually focus. But this is a very important topic for our nation. And we felt that as a part of the science and engineering enterprise, we needed more data. There, we started talking with the Census Bureau, the National Center for Education Statistics. We started talking with George Washington and George Mason Universities. We started talking with Chambers of Commerce just to understand what it would take to have more data here. Working with community colleges on technical aspects of degrees and also looking at what are AP courses that can be taken in high school that might lead one into a path of STEM that Kay described and also a career as a skilled technical workforce. So this took a community and a village of people in order to get quality data. That's one example. Amy, over to you. Oh, hi, sorry about that. Uh, thanks Imelda, yes, um, absolutely. Um, thank you for your perspective. Um, this has given us a really great uh, overview of um, all the data at the um, 
at the national level and, and how we can use it in policy. And so coming from all the different um, perspectives, this has been very, very helpful. So um, now that we've talked about um, these data in a global context, I'd love to come back to UK and ask, could you maybe talk about why the indicators matter on a community or state level? Right, thank you for that question, because I do use the indicator to look at the impact of research and development and science and technology all around the country. Uh, for example, when I visit a state, uh, then I like to look at the indicators to see well, what is the impact of science and technology on that state. You know, when decision makers want to consider policies to improve STEM education and the strength of science technology based industry within a state, they have to know and understand what is already happening in that state, where they need to improve and how their state compares with other states. So indicators is valuable because it lets you look at your state and indicators and also lets you see color coded maps and state tables to let you compare your state with your neighbors. You can get answers to questions like, well, who is in the STEM skilled workforce in your state? What are the leading STEM education institutions in your state and how do they fare compared to other states institutions? Where are the state and regional clusters of innovation in specific industries? So I like to, to take a look at that, not only when I go to a, a state, but also when I think about national policies, because to make it real, I like to have like a reference point. And so I'm from Ohio. I know some of you on the seminar are. So I always like to think of, you know, like science technology policies and say, hmm, what kind of impact is this going to have on Ohio as an example in my mind? Uh, sometimes I also look at uh, data on the institutions that I've been affiliated with. So I think about Boston University. I know you are on this seminar as well. So what's this going to mean for BU? Or how are these policies going to affect George Washington University, my other alma mater? So these indicators and the data behind them lets you look at national and global data and make it real for your community, your institution, and your state. And that's why I think it's so valuable for all of us. That's, that's a great, um, great overview of just how this can really be valuable for so many different um, um, stakeholders out there. So I would like to maybe ask Victor um, a similar question. How do you think these data can help um, or affect people maybe say like on a human level within communities when you start to really look at that more disaggregated level, what are some of the things you're seeing regarding how these data can be used in that way? Well, I think these data can be used, as I said earlier, is when you look at the data, the next question is, uh, what are you going to do about it? And so, for example, when we look at the declining math and science scores, the questions we really have to ask ourselves is, We've got to stay competitive. It is extremely important. Uh, and even if the numbers come in farther from other places, it's still important that we have our numbers maintain that too, in order, again, for economic development and national security. And let me focus there a little bit on the, on the national security aspect in the sense that um, for the Department of Defense, for the Department of Homeland Security, and for the Department of Energy, where also a lot of unclassified basic research happens. However, for people who worked in those industries, we need folks who are US citizens. And so as we have many laboratories, which are doing both basic and applied research uh, in these organizations, many of that workforce is starting to retire. You know, how do we get more of our workforce in there? And in one sense, also, how do we, when we look at indicators, how do we leverage our diversity? Um, as one of my colleagues over uh, the chief of Naval Research once told me, he said, Vic, you know, diversity is our greatest weapon. We just have to figure out how to leverage it. And so how do we bring all of these folks together to make that investment? I'll put here, Brooke, from a personal note. Um, I was born and raised in Washington, DC, and I was around when Sputnik happened. And I saw the investment that happened from the National Defense Education Authorization Act. Hundreds of millions of dollars were poured into the public schools. We learned a new math. We had science teachers that came in. They were bringing library books from everywhere. Uh, we had workbooks. We had flashcards, which I'm sure are now in the Smithsonian. But these things were extremely important in trying to develop the STEM workforce. And many of us, I mean, that's how 
I got my interest in science. My father, when I was six years old, we built a crystal radio set. Now, I didn't know anything about dipole oscillations, but it intrigued me enough. And then to say, hey, look, we're going to be the first to get to the moon, inspired a generation of men and women to, to come to this call. So with the statistics we see here, because if you remember, remember the gathering storm report that was led by Norm Augustine, where we talked about we needed a million STEM workers, that is it's, it's true. We need that going forward, particularly in some of the areas that we are uh, want to remain competitive in. For example, the automotive industry, the IT industry and content industry, it's extremely important. And so with this type of data, the board, for example, has just started a what I would call a subcommittee on K through 12 education, because we realize that probably over the past 40 years, there has been an unequal investment in local education, resulting in the smaller number of both women and men and, and people of color, minorities, you name it, going in here. Well, if we're at this Sputnik 2 moment, now is the time because there's great opportunity based on the indicators numbers to enter into these STEM fields and make a difference for the country. Yeah, thank you for those um, that insight. That's that's great to kind of put uh, all those pieces together, Rick. And it's it's so funny to know that you kind of started with the data and you're able to kind of weave that story together. Um, Amelda, I would love to turn uh, to you and ask you, you know, as the one who really knows these data just as about as good as anybody, when you're looking at it, what are some of the areas, uh, subject matter areas of the data that you see that really impact communities? And uh, who are the additional kinds of stakeholder groups that you think could really make use of these data? Well, again, as I'm listening to my other panelists here, I just, I get excited just thinking about, you know, the possibilities of the data use and what it can mean for communities. So let's just talk about the labor force and education. And I think what NCSES brings to the table is the merging of that data, linking of it. So what are the pathways, if you remember, we used to talk about a pipeline, but now we can talk about pathways that people can enter into STEM, enter in and out, and then what do they contribute in terms of their careers? So if you're looking to understand where you might start or where you might end up and what your career might look like, we have data that can inform that. We also have data that can inform policies around what education in those spaces should be, and also things like um, the impact of foreign um, degreed holders on the US enterprise. So there are all these opportunities to look at data and to make those links. Recently, we've been having discussions with people about the cyber infrastructure and cyber um, definitions and issues and data that can be available. So there's another community that I think we'll be engaging with a lot in the future. I heard a talk about regional innovation and we are definitely in that space, understanding what does it mean from businesses and micro business levels um, in terms of when do people have opportunities to introduce innovations in their work and where does that look like and when um, does that occur? So these are just some of the areas where I believe we have data that can impact communities. I also just wanna take a, a time, moment to mention that there are several executive orders say those around data equity, um, those around scientific integrity, a lot of the other topics where NCSES has data that can definitely inform those discussions, whether it's the indicators report or our other congressionally mandated report, women, minorities, and persons with disability, we definitely have data that can speak to some of the things that are of interest to the administration. Yeah, that's a good point, Amelda. We um, we have um, a lot, a wealth of data in the indicators reports, but we also have some other data from NCSES that would be great to uh, contribute to some of these policy discussions, I believe. So, um, Kay, leading from Amelda's response about stakeholders, how can researchers and students use the indicators data? I love how you started out talking about all the ways that you've used this over time. So maybe you can speak to those um, those groups in particular. Okay, well, thank you for that question, because, you know, 
I often think, well, if I discovered in the indicators even earlier in my life, maybe my life would have been a little bit different. You know, if you're a student, you can see how many students are in your field at the undergrad, grad, PhD, and postdoc levels. You can see where past graduates are employed. You can see how many people in your field go, to, go on to postdocs versus going into academia versus going to industry. You can follow people who graduated ahead of you to see their career trajectories. That's important information to have if you're think, as you're thinking about your study options and your career options. You know, and if you're a science policy student, you know, when I taught science policy classes, I had my students go through indicators to describe one example. How does your undergrad institution do in federal R&D funding? Another example, I mean, how does your undergraduate major field do in terms of STEM workforce and PhDs granted in the United States? Um, another assignment, what agencies are important for federal R&D performance in your home state? So all of those questions are answered primarily by indicators. And I know some of my students who are on this call are having flashbacks. Uh, so it was a, it's a great way to get started in doing science policy research. And that goes on to researchers. I know many science policy researchers are on, on this call. If you're a researcher, then you know these detailed data allow you to have fine-grained data on the shape of our U.S. STEM education system and the STEM skilled workforce. You can see who, you know, Victor and the National Science Board describe as the missing million. You can see the patterns of underrepresentation. You know, which fields are overwhelmingly male? And you can see how we lose talented people at every stage and disproportionately. You can see what percentage of PhD students and then PhD grads are African-American or another group by state, by type of institution, by scientific field. And as policymakers, we need researchers to make sense of these data, to combine these data with other data and their own and your own research to you know, not only make sense of those data, but then offer paths forward to try to correct these patterns of underrepresentation. Um, because by understanding in detail who's missing, we can begin to take action to make sure that they are not missing in the future. So for students and researchers, we are counting on you to make uh, use of these data and to let policymakers know what's happening uh, in your career, in your education, in your workforce journey. Yeah, I, I love the part where you say my, my life might have been different if I had known about these. I always think about I'm from the state of Kentucky, just south of where you're from, and I uh, worked in, uh, did in my own indicators report at that time when I worked there, and these would have been very helpful for that job. But another thing that you brought up was the missing millions. And so now I'd like to uh, uh, go to Victor and, and talk about how the National Science Board and the National Science Foundation have been calling attention to the need to address the missing millions in STEM for the US to remain an innovation leader. So can you say a little bit more about this and how Indicators helps in that kind of initiative? Oh, thank you, Amy. Yes, it really does help. Because first of all, it gives us a baseline. Who are the missing millions? Who are, who are those folks that are out there? So the, for those folks who are listening, if we look right now in terms of our s &E workforce, about 49% are about women, almost population parity, but then it really starts to fall off. Blacks are about 5%, that's not close to population parity. Latinos are about 8%, uh, that's not close to population parity. Uh, Native Americans are about 1%, 1 not even close. By the way, a shout out, to, to Sister Katahari Tekawatha, because today is her feast day, a Native American who made a difference. Those are the missing millions. Now, when we talked earlier in the conversation, this is a Sputnik II moment. We need everybody that is involved. This is where indicators helps us. Well, how do we get everybody involved? So for example, if you read the 2022 indicators and we talk about secondary education, and I've seen a few questions say, well, is it bad policies? Are these these things that lead to poor preparation of math and science? But I think if you look at indicators and you look at the teachers, okay, the data shows you that, for example, in, in minority areas or areas where there is science poverty, that is where there's a large number of students, for example, 
who are on lunch or breakfast programs, you see also they have the highest percentage of teachers who have the least experience in teaching. Okay, so um, you know if you you know two wrongs don't make a right. You know, if you have those areas that are not only uninvested, because as many people uh, may not realize, local education is funded by local taxes and the tax base. And then you couple that with teachers who have little preparation to teach in those areas, then that's how you start creating the missing millions. Okay, now I'm very hopeful, however, that we can address that because with current administration policies and support and support from the board, Plus the urgency Plus the that we know that we, that know we have to um, We are now going out and looking at those, uh, talking to those communities, okay? Uh, with NSF's new regional innovation engines coming out of its um, TIP directorate, that's uh, technology, um, innovation and partnerships. They're gonna be looking at the whole ecosystem. So it's not just the big schools, okay? But it's gonna also be businesses, it's going to be small businesses, regional industries, and then the minority serving institutions that have a history of doing it. So we're talking about the HBCUs, the HSIs, and the TCUs. Because again, uh, we've seen this story before. Again, I'll use World War II and the Cold War, where we got the Charles Drew, who came out of Howard University, where I got my PhD, go Bison, okay, who worked with the British to find a technique to preserve blood, or the Luis Alvarez's, who became Nobel Prize winners in physics. And by the way, he also had a sideline. He was the one that showed the iridium layer that showed why the dinosaurs died because of an asteroid. We've got all sorts of talent, you know, in the Appalachians, out west, in the Midwest, okay, in the barrios, you know, in Southeast Washington. And all we have to do is tap it. And again, with the information that we get out of indicators, we can go not only to the Congress, but we can go to local policymakers. Okay, you can go to your local and state governments. You can go to your superintendents of your K through 12 schools. And with that information say, we need to place a focus on this. We need to make a vet an investment on this. As uh, President Ronald Mason of the University of the District of Columbia always says, talent is equally distributed but access is not. And what we hope to do as a board and working with NSF and policymakers is how do we remove those obstacles and barriers so we can get the whole nation behind us such that we can address this Sputnik II moment. I love to watch the evolution of this discussion. We started off with just talking about data and now we're talking across you know, decades of, of um, science and engineering and where we've seen um, the history grow and how this can really fit into that bigger picture. So Milda, I would love to ask you, you know, um, talking about the missing millions and some of the situations that uh, Victor just described, how does NCSES and the indicators inform those types of situations? Well, Amy, that's a great question. And this is just, I, I'm, I just forgot for a moment that I was a panelist. I was enjoying this discussion so much. I think, um, you know, we provide the quality information. We do the work. We listen to the conversations, first of all. What are the needs? Where are the discussions um, leading us? What are um, some of the questions that people have? And then I think NCSES and the indicators starts doing a little bit of hard work. We start finding the data sources that are reliable and credible. We link those data sources. We talk to people about what can we do to create new data. And that's what's important to me because I'm starting to hear, as a, particularly as a chair of this Evidence Act Committee, I'm starting to hear people talk about linking data and acquiring data and disseminating data, sometimes as if it's, it's a new thing. And I think NCSES and Indicators has been doing this for a while. So this is exciting that we can elevate it to narratives. So data for just data sake, as I think Victor was describing, is really not useful. But indicators take that data and it provides a narrative around it that's useful for these discussions. And it is often in a global context. And I think that is where the value comes in. So it's pretty exciting that we talk with international partners 
at OECD, National Experts in Science, Technology, and Indicators, to be sure that we have comparable international statistics. We talk with our other federal statistical agencies, such as the Census Bureau, to make sure that we can have data available that talk about what people are doing across the country. As Kay was saying, it's about what are those needs across the country and how do we describe them? So it's really exciting to hear um, this moment that we're in. I would, I would add to the Sputnik example, I think we're also in a data evolution where it's becoming even more important to gather data and a quality, um, quality data using quality approaches that can inform decision-making. Thank you for that question. Thanks, Adilda. Thank you to all of our panelists. I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we're having a robust discussion happening in the Q&A uh, panel while we were getting to listen to all of these great insights that uh, your different perspectives are bringing to the conversation. So I wanna go there and start to answer some of these questions and let you know what um, our panelists are saying. So first of all, they say, thank you for your pathways language. And um, Kay, just to let you know, somebody's asking, um, can you share your syllabus? Okay, so yes, it's called S Science and Engineering Indicators. You can go to our website, there it is. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but I wanna go ahead and turn to the, um, turn to some of the questions. Okay, so someone said, thanks for the webinar. Um, is it really the position in world STEM ranking that matters or the impact? Um, they bring up the, um, example that um, in a nation with lots of more people, 1.4 billion, they would have more graduates in STEM than, you know, a nation that's smaller, you know, and what, what would be your all's ideas about focusing on increasing impact and, and how, we, um, how we can maybe start to um, get the inference from some of the, what, what kind of inferences do we want to get from some of the data that we put out there and how we can use that? I'll throw this out first, because I think that was yeah. one of the questions was directed toward a comment that I made. It's both, mm -hmm. uh, and because you, you've got to have the people in order to have the impact. And that's where the Vision 2030 document comes in. And I would ask anybody who is on the webinar, please draw it up. I think we've, we've shown it a link there. And one of the things is how do we deliver the benefits of research? And so it's extremely important that we do that for the nation. And I'll give you something that's very recent. You know, in 2010, we were very concerned at that time because we were still in the war on terror. Uh, what, what would happen if someone dropped a virus on us? So DARPA, one of our sister agencies with National Science Foundation, started the Pandemic Prevention Program. And they started working with mRNA, okay, uh, with a company called Moderna. You may have heard about it. Because the whole idea is that the state of the art at that time was three to five years to develop a vaccine. Well, that research, plus a lot of other things that NSF have funded in terms of CRISPR technology came together. And lo and behold, 10 years later, when we were in the middle of a pandemic, that foundational research was right there, okay, so that we could have Operation Warp Speed and we could get vaccines out to the general public and to the world. So what was important at that time? Not only the talent, so we needed the talent to be able to do that. And by the way, this was a DARPA program. So the people who had to work on this were people who were basically, uh, who were US citizens, okay? We had to draw on our talent base, but we also then had to have an impact. And I, can, I think there is no doubt or no argument that that vaccine development and that research that we spent the taxpayers' monies on, that they got a return on investment. Kay, did you also have something on that? I mean, my answer is actually a question. It's like, actually, you tell us. I mean, I have, we have our own ideas about what is important, and that is, you know, impact for me. Uh, but fortunately, if you go to indicators, you can find all sorts of data about, let's say, U.S. and China, the subject of the question. You can find the patent data, the citation data for scientific publications. You can see all the data, like, normalized per capita. Uh, or according to GDP. So it, it's tough for policymakers and all of us to make sense of you know, what are the really key data to focus on when we're trying to make decisions. So we are relying on the research community, the policy research community and students and faculty from all over to tell us you know, what are the data 
that are most important to describe the situation that we're in now. So homework assignment, go to the indicators and let <laughs> us know. Always teaching. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Um, I'm looking at some of the other questions. Um, so when we're looking at the way that the data are being used um, in a public realm, such as the media, and are not presented with the nuance that necessarily you know, needs to come with them, how are um, just general users that are receiving that information, how, how can they better tell um, gray with the data instead of just black and white? How can they begin to get some of those nuances? And are, do you have any sort of um, kind of direction on how to begin to become um, more savvy with these data and how to really use them for your own work? <laughs> Any thoughts? I want Imelda to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I think first of all, what's really important is that it's a comprehensive approach. So we're getting the quality data um, and we're checking our data sources and making sure that it's reliable. And then we're counting on our communities to tell us um, how that data aligns with what their needs are and also to tell us where there might be gaps. And then we're looking for those narratives so from the community. So I would look at something like a regional innovation question where you have those national level data that can show you what are some of the trends that have occurred? Um, where do we see say some outliers? And then you go to your state and local um, governments, and now they can start to use those data, start to interpret those data. But it's actually in the application at that regional level that you start to know the quality and the importance of such data. That's one side. I get the feeling there might this question might have had another slant to it. So I will mention that um, a part of my excitement of being at NSF is that it is a research-based organization. And so we work closely with um, the National Academies of Science and Engineering, um, um, NASM, um, to investigate these kinds of topics in terms of misinformation or disinformation and the impact that that can have. Then those types of findings are also translated. We use that to inform our data collections and how we can make sure that we are presenting the data with the best quality possible. We also build in quality factors into our analysis so that you, we want to take as much of the worry about the quality of the data away from you as a user, making it more easy for you to just not necessarily plug and play. But again, when we start talking about gray, we start relying on our communities to help us to disambiguate some of the concerns. Thank you, Melda. that's really helpful. Um, so there has been a lot of discussion in the Q&A about um, the state of K-12 STEM education. So um, someone even commented that uh, looking at the poor math preparedness, especially at the high school level, is a troubling development. Um, so I'd love to ask you, you know, how you, um, what, you're, what you're seeing about how, like, say, the board, the administration is doing about bringing attention to the K through 12 STEM education and, and um, how these data can continue to um, inform some of those policy discussions. Go ahead, Kay. Okay. <laughs> and then I'll talk from the board. Yeah. So, I mean, here in the federal government, recognizing that, you know, K 12 education is, you know, state, local, and private responsibility. I mean, there are a couple of tools that federal government has. Uh, among them is the fact that a dozen different federal agencies have STEM education programs that are, you know, designed to help, you know, teachers and schools all around the country to be better at, you know, providing science and math education to students. And, you know, to understand the impact of what these federal programs are having, we rely on the data. We, we start with the data. And over time, I've been fortunate enough that my office, OSTP, leads a federal committee on STEM education. And we're continually looking for ways in which we can use federal tools and resources to, to really be better 
partners and supporters of what's going on in schools around science and math education. And, you know, that's not a pat answer. It's a continually evolving process because we all recognize we have to do better as a nation in science and math education. And because our landscape is changing, we have to be ready each year, each school year to you know, keep, keep refining that process. Um, so I don't have an answer, but I do know where I go to to understand the landscape. And that, of course, are the data that we have about how American students are learning, how they're performing in science and math, and how those data differ between you know, demographic groups and states. I'll add to that uh, in that from a board point of view, I'll give you a couple of anecdotals uh, that were extremely important. You know, for example, NSF has a facility uh, in Louisiana, it's called LIGO, where we actually look at uh, uh, gravitational waves and able to see the earliest pictures of black holes there. But when you go down to that facility, in order to maintain the fine temperature differential that you need to operate that, you need HVAC people who understand how to maintain that environment, okay? And one of the issues down there was in that area to find those type of people is very, 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 very hard because of the demand, okay? Um, we also found out when we went to Detroit, we all know about electrical, electric vehicles. We've heard a lot about them. We've heard about autonomous vehicles, you know? But as the industry told us, and again, because let's face it, research, it's about the benefits of research that help us in, in terms of economic development, national security, and by the way, basic research. That's the motto of NSF, which has not changed since 1947. They said, we're going to need a million workers. But these are not the same workers that descended on Henry Ford's plant, where all you needed was a good alarm clock and a strong back. We need folks that understand electronics because automobiles are electromechanical systems. We need people who understand how to code because we're gonna have cars, your cars that you have right now are fitted anywhere between 50 to 100 different sensors. We need people who know systems engineering. How do I bring those mechanical, electronic, and eventually uh, Bluetooth and 5G coming together in all of these systems? Um, if you think about it, it's really important that from us, from the National Science Board, we maintain the US science and engineering posture and realize 66% of people in the United States do not have degrees. And, we're, and so what we see, because I saw a question in the chat is, how do we put those off ramps and on ramps into different pathways to STEM careers, whether it's through certificates, whether it's through two years, four years, school, whether it's through the military or going right into it. From our point of view, it's extremely important that first folks start out with those STEM-based skills that they get through K through 12. And that means, again, if what we have to do is even come out to you, as was said earlier, because for example, the need that you may have in Texas is very different than what's needed in the Pacific Northwest, which may be very different in the automotive factories that are in Tennessee and in the Midwest, or for example, what people are doing in computer simulation in Florida. Well, I just, this has been a very informative webinar and I'd really like to just thank all of our panelists again, Kay, Vic, Amilda, thank you so much for helping us get to know the indicators better. And thank everyone here for joining us. We hope that, um, we hope that you can uh, use and benefit from the resources that we've outlined here today. And if you have any more questions that weren't answered here today, we tried to answer them as much as we could in, in uh, real time and also here with our panelists at the end. Um, you can always contact us on the slide and we'll make sure your question gets to the right person. Please share this information with your colleagues and we uh, hope that you guys will all have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.